Sweet as. Okay, so today, lecture five, blockchain scaling. We've spent now past two sessions or, you know, two weeks talking about consensus, which is a major important topic in terms of understanding how blockchains work, how you can differentiate between different blockchains, uh, and of course, going forward, reading the specs, learning about blockchains, how you can start to make sense of them and sort of maybe try to strip away some of the advertising and marketing that you get on some of these websites. And we'll see a little bit of that today in, uh, in one particular metric called transactions per second. You know, it's sort of number go up, bigger is better. And so we'll see a little bit of this. Uh, and then like before that, we spent a whole session on cryptography, trying to understand why blockchains can present a secure source of information. Uh, and, you know, public-private key pairs play a huge part in this, as they do in all of our digital communication. Uh, so today, if we now sort of have, let's say, a rough idea of what a blockchain is, you can look at something and read some specs and determine for yourself, like, yeah, that seems like a blockchain, or no, that seems like it's got this like weird twist that uh, maybe doesn't make sense. Uh, we want to talk about this idea of scaling. So we're going to do a whole session just on scalability. So today's intro question, what happens during growth? So it could be growth of a distributed blockchain system, which would be particularly relevant, or it could be you know, growth of something else that you've witnessed. Even it could be biological growth. So what do you think happens during growth? What are some of the consequences, side effects? Okay, what's that have to do with growth? More That's implying what more more data. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Good place to start. So more blocks, more data could result in slowing down. Okay. What else? What happens during growth? Sure. Sure. Okay. So yeah, we got more data. What are some consequences then of more data? We need more, maybe more computation, right? You have to yeah. Run a long time to Miners will run a long time. So yeah, if you're running your own node and you encounter a heap of complex computation that every node has to verify, uh, that could take a long time. We're, we're used to computation being fast, but it doesn't have to be. Is it possible that you want to need more power? Why do you need more power? I think you're absolutely right. And what about some of the secondary consequences of growth. So yeah, more computation, more power, maybe things slow down. Okay. Go ahead. Um, like more people on board, so it's like Brilliant expression, right? There's more, there's more cooks in the kitchen, right? So yeah, we're gonna have more of all of this stuff. You're gonna have more people there and the more people that are there they need more support so if you think of like an organization as it expands you're going to go from like one cafe to two cafes right uh well you, you can't be in two places at once so you got to hire more people right it takes more resources of everything to get this up and running and so i think there's some parallels here also with biology um a biological system as it's trying to scale, you know, by nature, by its, uh, by its DNA, trying to spread its own DNA. Uh, we have a few words for this, right? One of them is like, when you introduce a species, it can become invasive. And so you like try to bring in like one species to like, I don't know, kill all of the grasshoppers or something or eat all the grasshoppers, right? And then it ends up taking over uh, and so all the species is doing is trying to grow and, you know, maximize its use of available resources. Uh, and so we have a word for this in the human body as well, as well, right? Growth that is unfettered without control is cancer. And so all cancer is, is like a cell that sort of loses its way and ends up just multiplying over and over again. Uh, and that's why there's, you know, different types of cancers for every different function in the body because of the different kinds of cells. Uh, and so if we kind of relate this idea of like cancer is just growth, 
And also, so is like regular expansion is just growth. Uh, I think my point here is that you can't avoid it. So things are gonna grow, things are gonna scale. And if they don't want to scale, even if Bitcoin is slow, people are gonna come in and be like, well, how can I do it? I'm, I'm gonna try to do it anyways. And they're gonna try to scale it. So uh, yeah, we absolutely need more, more of all of the computing stuff. But also on top of this comes all the social stuff as well. And so we've got like coordinating all those cooks so that, you know, every, uh, every roasted duck goes out and tastes beautiful, right? And we gotta organize that coordination. Okay, so a little bit of history here. Some like ultra nerdy internet type stuff. So the OSI model for characterizing the functions of a telecommunication or computing system. This is just the chart off of Wikipedia. If we start at the bottom, well, I guess first of all, computing system, that's pretty broad, right? Telecommunication or computing. If we start at the bottom, we need something physical, transmission and reception of raw bit streams over a physical medium. And it doesn't seem like we'll ever get away from this, right? We have to have some initial link from bits uh, to atoms. And then once we have that sorted, we can think about uh, a data link, transmission of data frames between two nodes, and then we can maybe start to get fancy with our networking and we can start to have packets zipping around between different computing nodes. And if you start doing this, you might need to improve processes around addressing, routing, and traffic control. And so each of those would then be like subsystems. This is all consequence of needing to grow that network. We need to, uh, we need to introduce all of these different processes and ways to organize it. If we keep going up, we can get to a transport layer. Uh, we can get up to a data packet layer involving a session or presentation. And then finally, at layer seven, we get to high level APIs, including resource sharing and remote file access. So this is what we're used to. We're used to being able to say, oh yeah, I want that data. Let's get the API. And then we get grumpy if we have to pay for the data, but you do it anyways, just so that you can get the data uh, through the API. And if it's really cutting edge stuff, right, you might have to write your own API to do it. Uh, and you know, that's a fairly skilled job in tech to be able to do that. Um, and, and these other things like resource sharing and file access that we kind of take for granted and are used to. But as a tech stack, right, this didn't just you know, emerge fully formed out of you know, the 1978 idea of joining up a couple of computers together so that you can make your work life a bit easier, right? Uh, this emerged over many years and lots of debate. So here's just a quick example of what this looks like from a long time ago, October 89. So the RFC is a request for comments 1122 about communication layers for internet hosts. Uh, and so this thing covers the link layer, the IP layer, the transport layer, uh, and then another document to cover application and support protocols. So if you are into networking or if you're involved in the networking side of an organization, you probably know a lot about this type of thing. Uh, and this is like, this is a modern screenshot. This is what it looks like just in plain text on the web. And you know, these documents get very specific. So I pulled out just a kind of random example here. So a host must not send a datagram with a time to live value of zero. And a host must not discard a datagram if the TTL received was less than two. So this like time to live thing, this prevents random datagrams, as it says, which are like packets, from just traveling around the internet with no destination getting lost. And so you have a timeout, so the packet eventually dies off. And so you know if you're a router, or if you're involved in a routing protocol, you're not inspecting the packets, you're just looking at the forwarding address and sending to make sure that all the traffic goes to where it wants to. Uh, and so this prevents packets that get lost or packets that don't have a proper destination. This prevents them from continuing to circle and put extra load on the network. So like, you know, very good idea, very obvious idea in hindsight, but something you wouldn't know about unless you were involved in this type of networking. Uh, 
I think there's probably like a sci-fi story in here as well where like a uh, human consciousness datagram gets uploaded and doesn't have like a proper routing destination and it doesn't have a time to, or has a time to live set to infinity uh, and just has to roam the network or something like that. So over these years, you know, since 1989, uh, I guess networking started before 89, but we've developed now an internet standard for communications. And the standard says we start at the link layer, we go to the internet layer or the interlinked layer. Then we have a transport layer to manage all of our traffic. And then finally up here, we can, you know, get to our favorite application. You know, we can get to our, if it's an HTTP type application, we can get to like the Uniswap interface, right? But let's say you want to swap some coins, you're going to go to Uniswap, you know, you take it for granted that all this stuff underneath is working and operational. Right, and also we take for granted that somebody can fix it if it, go, if it goes wrong, which is maybe another, uh, another tangent. Um, here's one that I like from a security textbook saying that actually we should start at the physical layer um, rather than the link layer. So the example here is an integrated circuit, and then we stack on top of that with some examples of acronyms you'll recognize if uh, you've done any type of networking. So of course there's parallels in blockchain land, but blockchains haven't been around since 1989 with tons of nerds contributing to documentation on the internet. So here are just some quick examples of what we see. Uh, blockchain tech stack by uh, this like info site 101 blockchains and I had a look yesterday and it's still like the top hit when you Google blockchain tech stack. Uh, anyways, so we have some infrastructure at the bottom, some networking, a protocol, so like consensus doesn't show up till the middle here. Side chains actually, we'll talk about those today. Uh, and then on top of that, we've got some other stuff, you know, multi-signatures, we talked about that a bit. Digital assets, DAOs, state channels. Actually, we'll talk about state channels today too. And then finally at the top here, we have some browsers and some applications and, and also some programming languages, you know, because programming languages are generic and can be used to make anything. So, I mean, it's just an example. There's no like right or wrong, correct or incorrect way to do this. For example, we've got state channels up here, which today we're going to talk about our scaling solution similar to side chains, which are a layer below it. Uh, and so I'm not going to spend any time debating whether or not this is a correct way to view it, but it's just one way to do so. Here's one that looks a little bit more simple by whoever commerce happens to be. Um, so we start at the bottom with some, some networking peer-to-peer, -peer, right? We recognize that from the white paper, Satoshi's white paper, very first word, peer-to-peer -peer digital or electronic cash. And then we have a couple of others, base and scalability layer. And then on top of that, we can do some stuff with them, storage and logic. And then finally at the top, we have our applications. So we do see some trends here. We've got like, if, if it's a stack and one goes on top of the other, you've got like your circuit board at the bottom, right? And you've got, you know, your shiny application at the top. And then in between, I mean, we don't even have like, there's nothing like really blockchain specific in here. Maybe the word chain, that's it. Uh, next up is one from Deloitte, right? So Deloitte are accountants. And so presumably they have a different perspective on this whole thing compared to the other ones. Uh, and so at the bottom, you know, they put their infrastructure, but they group it all together. So storage is down here. Whereas commerce puts storage up here, and if we're counting, that's like four from the bottom. Uh, and so on. They have some like interesting icons, I think. Proof of work gets a dollar sign. Proof of stake gets a calculator. All right, gossip gets two dudes and a lady. Uh, and so, you know, obviously somebody had to come up with the, the icons for this. But the closer you look, sort of the more, the, the funnier it gets. Um, and you can kind of tell from the like nice, color 
palette of it, right? That it's it's not really it, it's probably more meant for marketing than than anything else. You know, there's there's not real information in here. I would say if I, if I'm being um, particular. All right, so here is, let's merge these together. So here's one that I wrote up. So this is, you know, again, just how I see this idea of a tech stack. So let's make it simple. Uh, and it's, it seems to start off simple. I like to put consensus here at layer one. The example is proof of work. And this is where I'm anchoring it. So we get this word layer one, which have come up a couple times. Today we're going to actually elucidate what they are. Uh, so layer one is already in the lexicon. We already know apparently what layer one is. And since it is in the language, it's very hard to change, right? Once, you know, you can't, you can't predict how a meme becomes popular. You can't predict how a word becomes popular in the language. And once it's there, you're stuck with it. So a perfect example is like, up here, smart contracts, right? You know, they're neither smart uh, nor contracts in any sense. Um, really, they're like snippets of code or they're like small programs, but we're stuck with the phrasing smart contracts. So we're anchoring this at layer one. And then if we build on layer one, we've got what's now called layer two only because it comes after layer one. And that is where we get payment channels. If we go down, we need some networking, so we need our nodes to be able to talk to each other. And before that, we need some physical hardware. So, you know, in this sense, it also doesn't, my, my vision here doesn't make sense because we've got like a zero, a layer zero, and we've got a layer minus one, which if nothing else, perhaps is confusing. Although personally, I like things that start at number zero um, as my preference. Finally, on the top here, we've got some dApps. So any type of DeFi. Bitcoin is a little bit light on the, on the dApps, um, although now we have some NFTs on Bitcoin, so maybe I could put that in there. They're called inscriptions, uh, which is a consequence or an unintended consequence of some of the scaling that Bitcoin has done. Okay, quick meme here about protocols. Fat protocols is the title of this graphic from Union Square Ventures. So they're like a tech VC company. And this is a few years old now. And they were looking at where the value is. So obviously, if you're investing in new businesses and entrepreneurs, right, this is part of your business is figuring out where the value is. Uh, and so they say the fat, the fat layer in terms of the cash, in terms of making money, is the application layer in Web 2.0, you know, HTTPS. And so that application layer, right, that's um, our, our YouTube, uh, that's our Wikipedia, that's um, our social media, right? Lots of different applications, a lot of people making money, a lot of opportunity there. Not many people making money on like designing faster email protocols, okay? Not many people down here, not a lot of money to be made by having a better distributed database algorithm. Um, and because of that, a lot of that work happens in-house at the big tech companies, as opposed to by entrepreneurs and small groups of innovators. So fast forward to blockchains, and we kind of like flip the script here. So the FAT protocol they're talking about is this part here, that the protocol itself is FAT in Web3 or in the blockchain era. And you know, they're referring here to the idea that you can just mint tokens when you release a new protocol. So if you think back to a couple of years ago, we had this thing, the ICO craze. Uh, a lot of new ideas coming on, either on top of Ethereum or as fundraising for their own separate blockchain and project. Uh, and this was really where the money was to be made, sort of 2017, 2018, even into 2019. And so the value came from these brand new protocols. And unfortunately, I think a lot of it was just minting their own version of money or minting their own token, claiming that it's got value, selling it to people like you and me, and then hoping for the best. That's a nice way to put it. So 
the application layer here, there wasn't much to be made. I'll reference Uniswap again. There's not a lot of money to be made by funding the Uniswap team because Uniswap isn't selling anyone anything. It's just matching up liquidity providers with um, people that want to make swaps. And then they're exchanging fees via the mechanism themselves uh, outside of, of Uniswap, of Uniswap, the sort of um, governing body. So the applications here, especially you know, as a decentralized network, there's not necessarily a lot of obvious money to be made. I think there is, but it's just not the same as in Web2. Now, thinking forward to today, and I think this has transitioned down a bit. So I think the protocol layer is now a lot thinner and the application layer is a lot fatter. So the early days of minting easy money, I think those are pretty much gone. And now you kind of have to prove your innovation in order to get in on that. And that comes is coming at the top here at the application. OK, so another look at blockchains. So we've got a tech stack. We need that in order to evolve. We need all of these pieces to work well together in order to grow. Uh, and as these systems have grown up a little bit, we have seen what's called the blockchain trilemma in action. So a dilemma means that no matter who you choose, there's a downside. Right? There's no there's no win-win. You choose to go out for dinner with one friend, your other friend is upset you didn't choose them. Right, So it doesn't matter who you pick. So a trilemma here, we're saying it doesn't matter what two items you pick, the third one you're going to have to sacrifice. Uh, and you can go round and round and try to like optimize for the various ones here. So we can only pick two out of three. Let's get my pen out. So I think, just having a look here, security, uh, probably maybe should be number one. Um, you know, if your protocol isn't secure and someone can come in and clean out all your customers, right, or someone can come in uh, and plant some malicious code, can violate consensus, can double spend, right, if your security has that hole, that's it, you're done. Go home, take a vacation, come back in a couple months and start something new, right? So I think and maybe philosophically, this like upends the idea of the trilemma. I think security is a given. We have to have security. So then, at that point, it comes down to these two. So scalability or decentralization. So from the point of view of decentralized open systems, people often say that this one is number two, right? So they say, absolutely. We want it to be centralized. And that then gives you all of those decentralized benefits. Anyone can join, anyone can leave. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, censorship resistance. So you can't have a state actor say, no, you're not allowed to participate, right? This, these are the things we want in a decentralized network. And so taking our two main blockchains, Bitcoin and Ethereum, they seem to sit here. Now you can argue and the people that love one of those chains more than the other, they love to argue about these things. And that's, you know, great, good, good debate. But it seems like we need these two, which then leaves scalability uh, out in the cold, so to speak, whereby we're going to come back later and fix scalability. So we're going to really guard decentralization and security. Those are our core values. And then after, if we got enough energy left, we're going to look at scalability. OK, so scalability. Let's do a quick picture of what this means. <coughs> OK, so starting with scale, we say, well, that's, that's great. It sounds like a, sounds like a good word. Like, yes, I want to go tell my investors that we are scaling. Yeah, we're doing great. I, I, you know, but like, what does scalability mean? So I think that generally we're looking for users, 
and you know this is not at all to do with blockchains. This is the idea of, I guess, growth we were talking about at the beginning. I think we humans have a natural tendency to want to, you know, um, leverage our experience and our knowledge and and make things grow. Right? Even if systems are good, we tend to grow them anyways, just for the just for the sake of it. And so that growth, well. I guess it just comes down to more users. You want more people using it. You know, Bitcoin's not going to work if only, pick a small number, if only one million people globally are using are using Bitcoin, right? Such a small number, it's barely on the map. Uh, it's, I mean, it's still a small number, but it's been, it's been doing pretty well at growing. If we get more people to sign up, this is where we have to go then and accommodate more people, right? Once they want to get into the network. It's an open network, so anyone can join at any time. So we better be ready when they want to join. And <coughs> if we have a lot of people joining, let's we'll put TX, we're going to have more transactions. So just as you said right at the beginning, right? Uh, you're going to have more transactions as, as you grow. Uh, we'll come back to this. It's kind of a bit of a, it's an okay metric. It's not great, this idea of transactions because not just people make transactions, right, but other nodes and entities and bots can make transactions. But that's, I don't think that's a problem, it's just we have to be aware of it. Okay, and then I got one more here. If we have more transactions, well, we still have the old blockchain from 2009. that we want to fit them into. So as these get bigger and come down, what happens is we're just filling up the block. And full blocks, I guess, are a good thing because it signifies that your network is being used. But if the block is over full, too full, then uh, I can't get in without paying a high fee. And if the fee is very high, that cuts me out, right? Suddenly there's this, um, you know, economic disparity, right? The poor can't play because they don't have the high fees. So hopefully we can get some trade-offs here so that everyone can keep playing. Okay, so what can we do here? Well, basically, we can start adjusting this at the block level. And we saw this in the early days when folks were forking the protocols and making their own. They were taking Bitcoin, forking it, saying, uh, basically two things that you can do here, right? If you want to get more transactions, you know, into the block. Well, let's pass it to you. What can we do here? You want to fit more transactions in. What can you do? Of course. Increase the size of the block. Right, so got more stuff, get a bigger garage, right? Increase the size of the block. Look at this. I just drew one line and we could put fit four times the data in that block, okay? What else can we do? Who said that? And then you need more of them. Yeah, okay, so we get a bigger storage unit. And then, you know, we're limited if this down here, is TN, the next block, let's draw it the same size. The previous block TN minus one was limited by this mechanism that said 10 minutes, and we can't really game that through the rules of the protocol. So Litecoin came along and changed the delta here down to two and a half minutes. Just boop, 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 that's it. And they made the change. Uh, they made some other changes as well, but it, you know, it was very light in the innovation that they did. So as Leo said, if we want more blocks in here, well, what we have to do to sort of try to fit this into the same diagram here. If this much is 10 minutes, we need to shrink the block time. Uh, 
Okay, shorter block time. So we've got two knobs immediate that we could turn to get the performance we want out of our blockchain. Each knob comes with limits, extremes on either side, and problems are going to start to happen when we do that. And we can kind of imagine, okay, so like, let's do block time first. Block time too big, let's say block time is every year we get a block. I right, we're like, that's a, that's pretty useless. <laughs> uh, you know, that's, that's good for nothing, maybe like a university experiment, right? So big block time, not really helpful because we need time to settlement. If you pay someone, we need the other person to know that they've got the money. So big block times definitely don't help. Shorter block times, so let's go down to like one second or half a second. And what's the problem with a shorter block time? All right, that's a, that's a pretty good understanding. So it's talking about um, shorter block time uh, and the mining that's going to happen, and you're going to have a lot more forks. So if the block time is too short, thinking about longest chain style, um, you know, if the block time, if it takes a couple hundred milliseconds to go around the world, if the block time is really, really short, you're going to get blocks before that conflict. You're going to get blocks that conflict with other blocks that are also coming in. We already have this situation with big block times, but if it's really short, you're gonna have a lot of blocks coming in from your miners, and you're gonna have a lot of forks in the network, and the network basically could stall. So if there's too many forks, we don't know which one's the true fork. Um, and you know, that's one of the prime reasons for <coughs> 10 minutes, is so everyone can catch up. So even if somebody finds a note, finds a block in two minutes really fast, if you push it out, everyone now ha still has time to catch up to, to the state. Okay, that's, that's good. What about big blocks? What's the problem with a really small block? Let's make our block 1,000 bytes. Or less. Let's make our block 2 bytes. Really, really small, you can't even fit a transaction in the block, right? Again, you go, Jeff, what are you doing? Like, that's not a blockchain, I can't use it. So a really small doesn't make sense. On the other side, and there are people that believe the other way, big blocks, they're called, these people are called big blockers. Um, what is the problem with a big block? So we'll think like 100 gigabytes for a big block. If I'm processing all the information in the network, I gotta store the, all the data on my computer, which means that when I run the software, I have to download all the information and validate it for myself. So 100 gigs, it's fine for Amazon to handle, right? It's even fine for like one process, but trying to do a large block in a short amount of time, and you're gonna run into the same problem as um, too many forks, is that people aren't going to be able to agree on consensus. Be like, hey, I didn't even download that block, and you're already like going on, going on to the next one. Or like, hey, I didn't download that block, and my transaction is in it, I can't validate it until I get it and do it myself. Uh, so between these two parameters, bigger blocks and shorter block time, there are trade-offs each way, and there's no like obvious answer. There's probably like, for one set of parameters, there's probably an optimum, um, but that doesn't mean that it's you know like the best way to do it. So that's one and two, and these have kind of been explored.
in forks. So uh, BSV has huge blocks. I think they're like four gigabytes or something. Right. Bitcoin has four megabyte blocks. BSV has huge blocks. And of course, nobody's using it, right? First of all, it's a ripoff of Bitcoin. But secondly, four gigs just it doesn't make sense. Maybe in another timeline, it would make sense. Again, with the shorter block time, I'll cite Litecoin again, two and a half minutes. But that doesn't mean people are using Litecoin. It just means that Litecoin has faster blocks. Um, so people are still using, using Bitcoin. So we do have a third option on the board here. And I'm going to put that one here. So our third option, TX for transaction. But this can be any data, any data you want. Good data on Bitcoin is to you know, consolidate some UTXOs or to send some Bitcoin and, and buy some pizzas. Uh, bad use of transaction data on Bitcoin might be to like upload a JPEG uh, and upload all of those bytes. Of course, that's not what it's designed for. Similarly with our other chains, what we're seeing is that this isn't cutting it anymore. And also once you publish your code, it's difficult to change, right? To change protocol level stuff, you have to do a hard fork, so it's difficult to upgrade. So what we're seeing is people change what goes in to our TX data. And I'm just gonna put here number three. We're gonna outsource that data. So again, it's just data. Once you outsource it, you can do anything you want with it. And if you are somebody developing here in this idea, outsource, outsource. You, if you're developing there, uh, you know it's only up to your creativity, essentially, what we're gonna see, what you can do with that data. And then you're gonna take your mutated or different data, pop it in a regular transaction in a regular block, and people are gonna go about their business. And if they need to, we're gonna see uh, some interesting things they can do with that different data. Okay, so where are we at now? Isn't, isn't this good enough? What do we need to do? So here's like a snapshot of some of our systems. Okay, so Bitcoin at seven, it's at the top of the list, but also it's, uh, it's slow. And the marketing is that everything is fine. Or nowadays the marketing is uh, more to do with Lightning Network. Centralized, so I say not, this one meets our criteria of decentralization, which we haven't really detailed, but I think we will at some point talk about this you know, sliding scale of centralized, decentralized. So Ethereum, even though they had that huge upgrade last year to switch to proof of stake, they're still rocking 12 TPS transactions per second. The marketing says like, wait for this next EIP. That's an Ethereum improvement proposal. So it's always wait for the next thing that we've got in the pipeline. And there's some claims they're gonna get to 17,000 with a couple of these upgrades. Again, I say Ethereum is not centralized. Um, there are plenty of people out there that say that Ethereum is centralized, so that's subjective. Litecoin, I've been picking on a little bit today. They're running 56 transactions per second. If you look at the data, there's only one transaction per second in use. So it's got all this capacity to grow, right? Nobody's developing on, on Litecoin anymore. Litecoin is like a, a uh, let's call it a failed experiment. It's in the past. So one TPS since 2021. So because no one's up against the limit, nobody's trying to make it scale, right? If there's no demand there, why would someone donate their time to make it scale? We get into some of the centralized ones. PayPal claims they can do 450 on Cyber Monday. A couple more blockchains here. Stellar claims up to 10,000 in tests. Ripple claims up to 50,000. Um, 
I don't, I don't know about that, and I haven't spent too much time digging in to these. Uh, Ripple is centralized, right? You have to be a bank provider to use their network. So if you hear people talk about Ripple, they're probably talking about the token or the coin, but you have to be a bank provider to participate in, in the Ripple network. Uh, and then we get to Visa. This is, you know, our global network that at least here we're used to using often. Uh, I know in other countries they use sort of more digitally native networks. So they claim they can do 24K, but this was, I looked this up today, this was in 2010, and it was also in tests. Uh, it's rumored up to 100K for Singles Day, which is the Chinese shopping day, November 11th. And then it's like it's pr proprietary data, so you can't go in there and see for yourself. Whereas the blockchains, they have explorers and they have people just making charts saying, so you can go look at it. So I put Solana in here because it's a big number. So they're running 4,800. This is presently. In their documentation, they say they ha if you're on gigabit network, they have a theoretical bound of 710,000. So it's a lot. If we try to compare to... Visa on Singles Day. In order to have a global payments network, it looks like we need hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. You know, this is a uh, this is a quick and dirty analysis here. It looks like we need hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. If we think about blockchains, though, like Visa is only doing money, right? Visa is only doing single item. That's one transaction, right? The dollar value in Visa is huge. In blockchains. Uh, we're not just thinking money transfers, we're thinking data transfers, um, and the transfers could also be very, very small. It doesn't make sense for Visa to do transactions that are worth half of a cent, quarter of a cent, an eighth, but in blockchains with uh, highly divisible currencies and micro transactions, uh, you know, we're going to need a lot of transactions a second for this to really grow. My caveat here is that it said four, it says 4,800. This is a Jasana Explorer, but um, I, I'm not sure I necessarily believe that. I don't think that there's a lot of, there's not that much like human activity just yet on Solana. Solana has some interesting tech, but it seems like this could be, you know, uh, like automated transactions, or maybe they're applying like a slightly different, different metric. Solana in itself is a slightly different type of blockchain. Okay, let's get to now some of the solutions we've seen. So this is what people are doing to scale blockchains, right? This is not like a first principles approach to how to scale blockchains because no such thing exists. This is as close to first principles as we get. It's like, there's these three things, let's try them all. So first up, let's look at a state channel called the Lightning Network. So Lightning Network um, what is happening here is it is a state channel or a layer two. So think of our stack, layer one. On top goes layer two. On top of that can maybe finally go some apps. When we say that it is a state channel, we're thinking that the channel is just a tunnel between two people. So Alice and Bob, they make a transaction together. They kind of like get this joint bank account just for a single transaction. So they come into an agreement. In a joint bank account, you both can put in and take out funds, but you have to like sign a contract to do it together. Um, so the way that we're gonna do this is by two of two multi-sig, which I think is on the list, the, on the agenda for next week. So this means that you need two signatures to open and close that channel just like two people signing on a contract. So we sign up, we each put in half a coin, right? And then when we're done our business, we sign again and we take out the remaining balance that we're each owed. And if we have any disputes, we're not allowed to take out that balance. So a payment channel is opening up between Alice and Bob here outside of Bitcoin. So. The premise that we're looking at in this diagram 
is that Alice owes Eric for dinner. Right, so by using like the dinner example, it's a small amount. They don't want to go, they don't want to do the payment on chain because you have to wait at least 10 minutes uh, and you're going to pay high fees. So we're going to use Lightning Network, layer two scaling. Now Alice and Eric do not have their own channel together. If they did have their own channel, they could just immediately transfer between each other and it happens off chain. So they don't have to play by these blockchain rules. Because Alice and Eric do not have a channel, they're gonna, the payment is going to be routed through our other participants here. So Alice is going to pay Bob, is going to pay Carol, and so on, and then Eric is going to get the payment. So here's how the process looks, and then I'll just walk us through this. Uh, I know there's a lot, there's a lot here. So what Eric is going to do is he's going to send Alice an invoice. He's going to say, hey, please pay me $20 for dinner. With his invoice, he's going to generate a secret, R, and he's going to hash the secret. And that means that right, a hash is a one-way function. So that means that Alice gets the hash, but she doesn't know the secret. The way that this is implemented is with, um, in red here, a hash time-locked contract. So the hash is just a secret value that's hashed. So you don't know the secret. Time locked means it's going to expire at some point in the future. So if something happens in the routing chain, just like time to live, all right, it's going to expire and no harm, no loss, except a little bit of time. Okay. And none of the funds get paid out. So Eric invoices Alice. Alice through the routing network is going to invoice Bob or is going to send a payment to Bob, and Alice puts on a little bit extra to sweeten the deal. In the next hop, Bob here is going to peel off 001 Bitcoin. So he's going to take a bit for himself, right, for his trouble as a payment router. Carol is quite happy to play along. She's going to peel off a little bit for herself and send it to Diana, who does the same, peels off the 0 .001 and then sends it to Eric. So, you know, in this example, it took a few hops and you had to pay all those people along the way. Now they don't, they haven't been paid yet. Okay, so they're, they're just participating and they're, they know that they're waiting for their payment. Once it gets to Eric, step six, he's gonna look at it and say, perfect, I got my one Bitcoin from Alice. Here is the secret. And when you hash the secret, you're gonna be able to spend the funds. So he sends the secret back. Diana says, sweet, thank you. The difference between these two is 0 0.001. Back to Carol with the secret, back to Bob with the secret, back to Alice with the secret in order uh, to finish up. And all of this, so I, mean, so this is, I think there's some very clever things going on here with the hash time lock contract. Um, there's a whole separate part which has to do with how can you route to find people, which we're not going to discuss that, but that, you know, says how do you find Bob, how do you find Carol, and so on. Um, but this all happens off-chain. So this happens in the Lightning Network. So you've got some interface to the Lightning Network. You're using the same transaction format as Bitcoin so that it's kind of interoperable that way. You're obviously using the same currency, right, the same tokens in order to get in. In order to get into the Lightning Network, you need to lock up some Bitcoin. In order to get back out to the main chain, also that Bitcoin is going to come with you. So once you're in, you're free to do all your groceries and do all your small purchase transactions. Uh, and then periodically, you may need to leave. So you have to send a transaction back to the main chain, pay the main chain fees, and close that channel. But all this stuff here, this all happens at network speed. So that's you know, the, the beautiful consequence is that these payments, network speed is hundreds of milliseconds, right, are immediate. And so lightning transaction between me and you, it is settled on the spot. And you see it and you've got the funds available to you. The only catch is that now you're in another network. You're not in the Bitcoin network, you're in a second layer two network, but you're still spending Bitcoin. Okay, so it's speedy, that's what we want. 
Uh, fees are much, much lower than main chain Bitcoin. So again, that is also what we want. And we haven't bloated the TX data at all. Occasionally, we have to send this TX is when you make a payment channel. So when you open or close this channel, you need a TX. And that's it. The rest all happens in the Lightning Network. Another benefit is privacy here. You cannot track these transactions that happen on the Lightning Network, but you can track everything on Bitcoin. So this is our first scaling solution. I think because it probably has like the most development, or I'll say equal development to the top Ethereum solution. Um, so there's lots of people doing lots of different things, trying out lots of different uh, ways to do this. In tutorial at the end of, not in tutorial, but at the end of the course, I don't know, 11 or 12, we will um, probably try to send some Satoshis around using some Lightning wallets. Uh, and you can, well, I mean, you can do it. You can do it yourself. You just download a Lightning wallet and get started. Um, but we might do it in class at the end, closer to the end. OK, so it takes a bit to get what's going on here. I stole these diagrams from Mastering Bitcoin. They have a brilliant explanation in there with these, with these diagrams of uh, Lightning Network in use. So here's some stats. How's it looking? Last five years, you know, we have growth. Last couple of years, it's been a bit flat. Of course, there was kind of like a crash a year and a half ago, and a lot of people just stopped uh, in terms of their, uh, let's say, like experimenting. So, yeah, I mean, it's been flat, but it hasn't, you know, disappeared. So these are the number of nodes. A node would be like Carol, who has open channels to other people in the network. Uh, capacity here, if we look in orange, is the number of Bitcoin that are locked up in channels. So we're at about 4,000 Bitcoin in the total network. So it's like, it's a lot of money, but it's not a tremendous amount, $200 million. Uh, the chart should be fairly recent in dollar value. Um, actually, the dollar value is 150, right? So it's like, yeah, it's a lot of money, but it's not like, it's not like everybody stop what you're doing, this, this thing is blowing up type of money. Uh, but I think, you know, there has been considerable growth over the last five years. And from what I've seen, there's a lot of interesting things happening, uh, heaps that I can't keep up with in terms of Lightning Network development. Okay, so summary of state channels, you do it yourself off chain. And that means you can do what you want, you can do it at network speed, and you have privacy. You do need multi-sig to get in, and you do need to lock up some Bitcoin to get in. Um, so Lightning is on Bitcoin, Raiden is on Ethereum, although at this point it doesn't have a lot of participation, and it's probably soon to be deprecated and forgotten. So these are called state channels, where you open a channel to connect to the main state. Next up is rollups. And so this is where a lot of the other development is for Ethereum. It has to do with rollups. All right, so what's a rollup? Well, what we're going to do is we're just going to bundle all of our transactions into one. So here we're going to outsource our data. We're going to collect it all into one, and then we're going to do something with it so that we only send back a little bit to the chain. So the immediate benefits of bundling transactions is that you're going to re reduce your gas cost, which are your fees. Uh, so rollups on Ethereum, we're reducing them by, let's say, 100x straight away. So I mean, that's, that's huge. If it used to take you $12 to do a token swap on Ethereum layer 2, right? we're down to 12 cents to do a token swap. $12 is probably cheap for a token swap. It's probably maybe more like 20. So you're from $20 down to 20 cents. So we've got two that have emerged in development sort of right now. Uh, the optimistic variety is going to assume everyone's being honest. So that's where the word comes from, right? We're 
optimistically going to assume honesty. And the L2 aggregator here is just going to, the L2 aggregator here is just going to collect a bunch of transactions and then it's going to publish them for you. So the aggregator executes, uh, this is important obviously, it has to execute the transactions. So it does the computation, okay, and it pays the fees to go back to the main chain. So you, you are paying fees uh, on the layer two, but then it's using some fee mechanism to fund the payment of fees back on layer one. So we say it assumes honesty. If something goes wrong, um, this is kind of the downside. If something goes wrong, then you have to go back and rebuild the state, and this can take a lot of extra effort because of how they optimize this data. So they optimize the data by, um, instead, of, instead of putting the data in like a state storage in the contract, they put it in the call data, which is like the, uh, the, when you execute a function call, you know, you pass like an int, an address, uh, a send to, uh, and so they put the data in there and that stores it in a different spot in Ethereum, which isn't easily accessible. So if there's a dispute, then you have to go back and you have to build up um, the Merkle tree of everything that happened to figure out what happened, and that can take some time. So we assume honesty, but the trade-off is that in a dispute, uh, it could take a while to get it settled. The other version is a zero-knowledge rollup. These ones are like already up and running. Zero knowledge is sort of just a little bit further behind. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna prove the computation off chain. And then they're gonna take the proof part, which is the, the ZK. They're gonna take the zero knowledge proof, which is like a cryptographic function, just a bit of math. They're gonna put that proof on chain. So they're gonna put the proof on chain and they're gonna say, well, there it is, there's the proof, but that's not, going to be occupied by all this extra data uh, in terms of that the state then has to execute to transition. So the transition for both of these happens off-chain, and then you just publish a subset of the data on-chain. So we're really getting creative with what we do with our TX data. You still have to come back in here to get into a real block. Okay, let's take a break and listen to Vitalik talk about this. And then you just have the fact that the threat of a port uh, case being possible uh, can uh, drive honest behavior without uh, most of uh, that behavior ever needing to get into a port system, right? That kind of analogy uh, drives the Lightning Network, which is uh, basically the only kind of layer two that's uh, possible on uh, Bitcoin, and it also drives uh, your state channels, which are like the level people have always on Ethereum, as well as rollups, which are this more complicated thing that was only discovered later on Ethereum that are actually powerful enough that you can do smart contracts on top of that, right? So Lightning Network and State Channel support transactions and they support like uh, very limited kinds of uh, contracting. The rollups, they support like kind of full-on EVMs that are that kind of get indirectly verified inside the EVM. Um, so layer twos um, have kind of been the Ethereum scaling direction since then. And since then, there have been these discussions around data availability, right? Basically, the, the practical capacity limit to a layer two is how much data the uh, Ethereum chain, uh, chain itself can store, right? Because uh, one of the trade offs of rollups is that they do require the Ethereum chain to store a few bytes of data for every single transaction, like a lot less than uh, using Ethereum directly, but still uh, a subnet of data. Um, and that's where stuff like data availability sampling and EIP 4844, which is uh, looking um, scheduled to come, um, you know, early to mid, uh, internal, maybe maybe later next year, is is all about exactly. It. So the re like, the proto dig sharding is like a bit of a pun, right? Because uh, so first there's sharding, and then there is dig sharding, which is uh, this uh, version of uh, sharding, which was uh, created by Ethereum uh, researcher named Stankrad. And then there is proto dig sharding, which is called that because it's a stepping stone to full dig sharding. It doesn't technically shard data yet, though it does shard history and computation. Um, but it was also uh, created by another Ethereum researcher whose name is Proto Lambda, right? Uh, so, yeah, so proto dig sharding happening next year. 
And the other thing that, uh, like I've talked to the roll-up teams and they all want to do next year, is they want to start taking off trading wheels, right? So the roll-ups and uh, layer twos that exist on Ethereum today, they basically all have what I call trading wheels, like some kind of backdoor that lets developers uh, come in and like say stop and change the protocol if they see that some kind of bug is happening. And like trading wheels are obviously a, a yeah, you know, and upfront to the moral idea of trustlessness and um, all of those things. And nobody wants trading wheels to be in the status quo long term. Okay, I'll stop. Stop it there. So I mean, Vitalik moves at a fast clip. Nobody understands this stuff more than him. <clears throat> But you get an idea of some of the things we're talking about this, there today. So by next year, uh, I think this is about six months old, it said. So he mentioned some of the issues there with roll-ups here, being that they're still like early stage stuff. So, uh, you know, they're not very mature. And there are still some areas where the developers can like pause and make major changes. Make major changes to them. So one of the things he mentioned in there was about inherited security. So rollups themselves, uh, what they're doing is even though this stuff is happening off chain, being outsourced, they are tying in quite often to Ethereum so that they get the same security from Ethereum, uh, and that means they don't have their own consensus mechanism. Uh, they they're not doing anything with regards to. Um, blocks or with, with regards to epics and slots in Ethereum. Uh, all they're doing is batching and processing on Ethereum itself. Uh, and, and so this idea of where does the security come from uh, is going to be different in some of these other solutions. Okay, so what do I have up next here? This one here, sidechains. And we have Liquid as an example. So a side chain, I guess, as the name implies, you've got a chain off to the side. And in order to maintain any type of continuity, you need a two-way peg, which is a mechanism to go from the main chain to the side chain, and then back from the side chain to the main chain. And that's what we mean by, by two-way peg. So I, I, there's no good diagrams of this stuff because really it's just like one single chain and then beside it you've got another single chain. So these are some examples here. I, I, found, I found this as a like meme where uh, we've got the main chain doing its thing and then the side chain kind of like uh, claiming that it's important and that it needs to exist uh, and then going, oh look, somebody, somebody posted a transaction data on your chain. So, I put in some icons here. In order to get from main chain to side chain, you need to cross the bridge. And this, as I implied last week, or as we talked a small bit about last week, this is problematic. So these waters are shark infested, trying to get your assets bridged from one chain to the next. And once you do that, right, your assets are no longer good on the main chain. They're sitting there locked up and cannot be used. So these examples here, liquid, uh, roof stock, they all they give you your new version of that token on their chain. Uh, and then you know they're either philosophically aligned with the main chain or they're doing something to essentially convince you that nothing is going to go wrong and you're going to be able to take the bridge back across to the main chain. And so the, you know there's a bit of trust involved with this process. Uh, drive chains is, it's kind of a newish thing that has cropped up in, in Bitcoin. Uh, so as far as I know, that's another version of a side chain that allows you to do some new, new stuff. I don't know much about it, so that can be sort of self-review homework. Outside of Bitcoin, we have uh, Polygon. And Polygon has its own token called Matic. And Polygon is a layer two ETH scaling, but it's not a rollup, okay? And it's more of a side chain. Polygon, though, as a side chain, has its own consensus mechanism. Uh, same thing. You got to bridge your tokens into Polygon, and then uh, once you're once you're into the side chain, you can hopefully do some more stuff that you cannot do on the main chain, uh, with the benefit of faster settlement, lower fees, and then 
perhaps more creative output with what's available. So, you know, all of these offer sort of different reasons to exist uh, and try to, I guess, lure you into using them. So I guess nothing happened here and then it says, cool, someone wants to use me and put in a transaction, wrote it to the main chain. Side chains are like children with parents. You need a two-way peg, but the security isn't guaranteed, right? Your kid can run away and do what they want, whereas with rollups, the security is inherited. So some examples here, uh, Plasma is a sort of older version on Ethereum, which like Raiden does not have a lot of uptake these days. The ETH devs, as Vitalik implied, are concentrating on um, the rollups. Okay, last one for us then is going to be what can we do about storage? So these are transactions. So storage, we're thinking now into the chain itself, right? This data, whether it's big or small blocks, this data just gets appended to a database in your node. So when you're thinking about large global systems, lots of activity, yeah, we can have like bloat in the system and these nodes can get huge. And the problem with a node being too big is that it's difficult for an independent person uh, in terms of resource constraints, to, you know, download all the data, sync the data, run it on their own hardware and things like this. So where Bitcoin wins, Bitcoin's the gold standard that almost anyone can do it. You can do it, you can run Bitcoin on an old laptop. Uh, you can run it on a Raspberry Pi, although I think there are some issues with using a Raspberry Pi, but that's not Bitcoin's problems. But uh, Ethereum is much, much harder. Even like teams of professionals have trouble syncing the Ethereum blockchain because it's so big and unwieldy. And so this is where storage can come in. Sharding mentioned in that video, a system for highly available replicated data. This has nothing to do with blockchains. This is just from databases. So this charts from DigitalOcean. So you've got your original table here, right? This table is quite, quite nice and manageable, but if the table has hundreds of millions of records, you're gonna want to optimize. So a vertical partition, you need some link here. So customer ID is copied to vertical partition two. And then if you're only after color, you only need to look up table two, which is more efficient than looking through the whole thing. Likewise, in a horizontal partition, we maintain column headers, and then we split the records. And so you could do this however you want. You could say, you know, before 2005, this is in this old database, or you could say, you know, every, every year we have like our current records here, and then you have to go into the bigger database to access older ones, something like that. Uh, so, Quick uh, chat here about Google Spanner. Uh, Spanner is a database that stores Google's ad data. Google F1, the database for its ad business. Spanner was first described in 2012 for Google data centers. And Already by 2012, right, the ad business is Google's, you know, cash cow. That's where they make the bulk, like three quarters of their money is from advertising. And in, by 2012, their database was experiencing this bloat and it was not, no longer as snappy as they needed it to be. So they underwent a process of sharding this database and it took them two years to manually shard this one database. And then at the end of that process, they redesigned the whole thing so that it would automatically reshard as it went. And that's the version that they currently use. We see some other stuff we've talked about here. Paxos algorithm, um, hardware assisted clock synchronization. And what else did I want to point out? Oh, it's not in here, but it's in one of these references. It says Google's F1 database has five replicas. So I think there's a nice parallel here between blockchains, right? Five nodes in Google's F1 database. They're all in America um, and they're geographically separated. 
right? And so whenever they update their database, they have to send that data to the other four nodes. That's our message passing problem. Whereas our blockchains have thousands and thousands of nodes. And so it's really important to be able to have efficiency and scaling in a distributed style of system, right? Even Google had problems with their sharding. Okay, so sharding of the database. So uh, Vitalik mentioned about dank sharding, which is on the roadmap. It's up and coming. It is a style of sharding. That's another one that I don't know about yet, so I'll have to do my homework and read up on dank sharding. Another area for improvement in storage is through compression, right? And this, all data, not just blockchain data, if you can compress it, so if you can you know, even shave a few bytes off here and there, if you compress everything, it's a big efficiency gain. So I've got two examples here, which kind of fit into this category on Bitcoin. Uh, so SegWit and Taproot have both been implemented into Bitcoin Core, and the outcome of this has allowed the blocks to hold more data. So they managed to find efficiency in there uh, and we might talk more about these at a future future date. So this is our sort of our, our landscape, right? In one session, if we're gonna talk about scaling, this is our landscape of what, happen of what is happening. Again, this is not like from a first principle point of view saying, this, saying that there's a right way to do scaling and that there's a wrong path that you can, that you can go down because we don't really know yet in the short history of these chains what is best. Okay, let's look at l2beat.com. So Vitalik got a lot of blowback in that clip for saying that he wants the devs to take off the training wheels because as it stands now, there are areas um, where they can make changes. And people jumped on that and they're like, what, these, these layer twos aren't, uh, aren't finalized, aren't secure? So it, this, gives, this website gives you an indication of what he's, what he's on about. If we look here at, so these are, these are all different layer two imp implementations. The two I mentioned were Arbitrum and Optimism, which employ an optimistic rollup. But if we look at this, Arbitrum's at at least a stage one. These guys are in orange, stage zero, right? Now the proof system is still under development. So, I mean, I think there's a tendency here for people to latch on to new technology and think that uh, it needs to work exactly like, I don't know, exactly as well as the, the last Apple product, right? That's been in refinement for years and years and years. Uh, and so this could be kind of like maybe a startling wake up. You say, oh, look at all this layer two stuff that's going on. Uh, and then you say, oh, well, only a couple of them are even at stage one, according to this website. Um, and only two of them have over $1 billion in them. So again, it's six billion, very large number. But by the time you get to bottom of the top 10, right, it's under $100 million. Uh, and so sort of very experimental, tiny market share here. Um, but you, you, know, you can see some interesting things that are happening and you can get an idea of the development work people are doing. Right, this, the, uh, this industry is no longer just people at home in their garage trying things out, right? There's real money being locked up here, real careers, real jobs, uh, and real you know, innovation that, that is happening. And so presumably, if we have 29 experiments in layer two scaling, presumably some of them are gonna work and are gonna, you know, five years from now, we'll be talking about them as if uh, they, they never were in this experimental phase or as if it was a given. All right, coming back to our TPS, our transactions per second, which is kind of a, it's an okay, but not great metric. We just have to realize it doesn't mean necessarily these are people participating and sending real value. Bitcoin, right, that's now a feature, not a bug, and we're, as time goes on, it's unlikely we're gonna see more and more changes. It's sort of the idea is that it's slowing down because we don't wanna mess it up. Lightning Network, this is that at network speed, not settled on chain, 100,000 transactions per second. So that could 
really be a, a proper scaling solution. The bottleneck there is that you have to open these channels. And so if all of us wanted to have a channel with each other, right, you can do the math on 30 people, how many different two person pairings are in that group, and then try to scale to like a town, a city, a country. Uh, and so that's just, that's unlikely to, to help by the time we bring some of this transaction data back into the blocks. So long term, probably not for everyone, but that doesn't mean everyone has to use the same network. Ethereum is at 12, and as we've just seen, there's heaps happening on layer twos. Optimism and Arbitrum, lots of growth here. The five and the five and a half, these are current figures for transactions per second. So you could kind of add them together. One site says Ethereum's doing 30 transactions per second when you add up all the layer twos. If you believe the documentation, these could scale to quite high levels, 20 and 40,000. Um, and you know, by then the whole landscape could be very different. So I guess the point is here that we are seeing scalability improvements, but maybe not as fast as some people would want. Okay, the last option for scaling your blockchain uh, is to not scale your blockchain. Uh, and so just say, no, I've seen, I've seen all this complicated zero knowledge cryptographic off-chain proof proving stuff. Throw it out and just build from the ground up uh, and have a do-over. And so these are what I would call as alternate layer ones. And these ones here, Cosmos, Polkadot, Avalanche, Solana, I guess maybe Phantom as well. In the last two years, these got really popular as alt layer ones. Cosmos, Polkadot, and Avalanche, they have what's called like a multi-chain architecture. And so rather than main chain, side chain, roll up chain, other side chain, they, they say, well, let's build in all the chains at the beginning so that when you come in to Polkadot, you get your own blockchain. Now you have to bid for it and you have to contribute to, to the ecosystem but your app gets its own chain, and then together we're going to have secure properties based on everyone's chains operating in cooperation. So Cosmos calls them zones, Avalanche calls them subnets. Solana came along and they, they just did the whole blockchain from the ground up a lot different than the others. The way that they get their high throughput is just through fast synchronization. So they're down to like 800 milliseconds in blocks, which are in quotes, because they're not real blocks. Uh, and according to the documentation, it's more like streaming. So as soon as validators have transactions, they're just streamed to the network all the way back, 4,800 transactions per second. And then we have another category of not really blockchains, but they want to be blockchains, uh, called directed acyclic graphs. So Phantom is one of these. I think IOTA is another one from like eight years ago. I'm not sure the present state of IOTA, but they run a directed acyclic graph, which is like a tree structure uh, that can branch. And so there's kind of like a, a nearest neighbor mesh validation thing happening as opposed to sequential blocks. So they're not really a blockchain, but they're still playing in this distributed space. Um, as alternates to scaling our blockchain, starting with these two knobs here for block time and, and block size. Okay, that's a wrap for scaling. Next up, we got wallets and keys. And I think we also have these topics as well, multi-sig and MPC. Multi-sig I mentioned today, right? Two of two multi-sig in Lightning to open a channel. You and someone else have to commit funds and that requires both your signatures, two of two. So we'll talk about multi-signature. And MPC is multi-party computation. 